Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a little show that tries to deliver in so many ways with news and views for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Robin Adair, and joining me as always, the Croatian sensation, the man of La Mancha, John Jurisic. <laughs> and John, uh, there's so much going on. So much going on. And, you know, I have a little workout while you introduce me. I'm so happy about that. And there is. It's because there's so much going on. I'm so excited. You know, but one of the premier issues, premier, get it, uh, is certainly the BC doctor's shortage. As everybody talking, doesn't it? Uh, and now the premier, John Horgan, has been caught swearing during question period. What the frig is that all about? Nearly a million British Columbians don't have a family doctor. Nothing to be, uh, uh, nothing to be very um, laughable about, but you know, simply debating, this doesn't solve the issue. We need more doctors, Robin. We need more doctors and we need them now. What is up with that? I'd like again to commend BC Healthcare Matters and Camille Curry. They're holding a public meetings and staging a big rally on the legislature lawn on Thursday, May the 17th. Mark it in your calendar. Go down there. Um, demand that we change the policies and get more doctors. Their families with children, they can't get into emergency. We well, continue. also in a city like Victoria where so many people are, well, over 65 or certainly in their 60s and pushing up that direction, the baby boomers are getting older. Baby boomers need doctors too. And that's a big problem. One out of four in Southern Vancouver Island don't have a doctor. So it's a big big issue. We also spoke to David Bush, who's a Victoria lawyer. Formerly, he was a nurse and a nursing instructor and happens to also be married to a physician. And uh, we, we talked to him about what needs to happen, what needs to change. He talked about the fact we need to speed up the training process, bring in more foreign doctors, and we also have to build more facilities to take away all the overhead on doctors so they can do their work effectively. This goes back for years. It's been a long time coming. You could talk to anyone in healthcare a decade ago. They were telling us we were in trouble. No one wanted to listen. First and foremost, now we're in so deep, there's no longer a short-term fix. There, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So you're talking a bare minimum of six years from this time you get accepted into medical school before you can start working as a doctor. Right now, I think there's a million people in British Columbia, was the stats I saw the other day, who don't have a family physician. Let's assume the family physician runs a load of 1,500 patients, uh, which is a decent set, which would be a fairly large practice. And that's just here in BC. This is a national problem across the board. We need to dramatically increase the enrollment in medical schools. Uh, now, yeah, they increased, they, they brought in the Northern Medical uh, School in Ontario. They increased uh, the medical schools here in BC as well. But what they really didn't do also is they didn't increase the number of residencies. So we're training more Canadian doctors, but we're not getting room for foreign doctors. But we need to you know, dramatically increase medical schools, dramatically increase the residency slots. And the residency slots are particularly important because that's going to allow a foreign doctor, whether they're trained in England or Uganda or India or Japan, it doesn't matter. When I was teaching nursing, one of my nursing students was an ER physician from the Ukraine. Uh, this was about 25 years ago. As she came to Canada, she couldn't practice medicine because she couldn't get a residency spot to show that she was safe. And consequently, she wound up enrolling in nursing because she's like, I can get through this quickly. I can't afford to spend another six years of my life and hundreds of thousands of dollars to show that I'm still qualified to be a doctor. You know, Robin, David Bush was a conservative candidate in the last federal election. He took on Elizabeth May. That's quite the titan in Saanich Gulf Islands and fell short. Um, I think anyone would. Uh, he's still active in the party and we'll have him back next week to talk about conservative leadership race and the big issues that they are dealing with. Just to give you a taste of this emergent conservative debate <laughs> that seems to be gathering storm and wind somewhere in this country. Here's a short clip of Pierre Polyev talking about woke politics. Those who want to tell us what we can see and say, right? You know, the new cancel culture warriors, you know, the, the, the woke warriors. Are there any woke folk here today? You know, 
I was in uh, I was in Toronto the other day, and the wolf folk wanted to cancel my event. They didn't want me to speak. Yeah, they said that uh, they said that I shouldn't be allowed to go to the steam whistle uh, warehouse there because. Yeah, and they, they started complaining, and they asked Steam Whistle to cancel the whole thing. And Steam Whistle didn't agree, but they put out a letter saying they didn't agree with all of my views. So, of course, they were gutless and watered down, just like their beer. And... Conservatives are sounding very tough, and this is going to be a hard-fought campaign, the leadership race in a very hard-fought Canadian election, I think. The real question is, the base may like this kind of language. How are most Canadians going to feel about it? The Tories actually had more overall vote support in Canada in the last election, but they couldn't pick up valuable seats in the big cities like Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Thus, they lost. And uh, time will tell. But what happens next? I agree, Robin. And, uh, and you know, Canada is a very large country consisting of both urban and rural votes. You can't just win by having the most votes. That's just not how our constitution works. You've got to attract all demographics across the country. So this, this kind of um, uh, argument that, uh, that they won the popular vote, uh, so what? You've got to win the most seats and that's how it works. Uh, on top of this, complicating matters is, is Justin Trudeau going to be hanging around three years from now? Is he going to go for another walk in the snow like his father and decide, that's it, I've had it? Um, looking around the corner uh, and uh, performing, in my opinion, extraordinarily admirably, is Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland, waiting in the wings, I think. So lots we don't know. The dynamics of what's going to happen three years from now is still uncertain. What we do know, I think, is that it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be rough. And where is that coming from, Robin? I don't think that's Canadian. Well, some of the language, some are. of the language isn't Canadian. Some of the things like, you know, we're going to make Canada... I don't know, strong free again, or again, free again, or all that sort of stuff. That sounds that sounds like something south of the line, doesn't it, John? Sure does. It sure does. So lots for us, I'm sure, to talk about on the Rumble Room. Anyway, let's move to another topic. Another one that uh, gets ugly pretty quick. Protests, Robin, that become a public nuisance. Absolutely. Environmentalists have really decided that the best way to get their message across is to block bridges and highways hold up cars for hours on end. Peaceful demonstrations, they say, but it's causing a lot of anger and a lot of public dissatisfaction. They say it's the only way, though, that they can permanently get old growth logging to stop in British Columbia. I don't know. In the uh, Iron Workers Bridge situation in Vancouver, it was blocked by the Save Old Growth Group, the same group that earlier blocked the Malahat, the highway at Terminal in Nanaimo, Pat Bay Highway, and back to the Lower Mainland Highway 1 in Burnaby. That's just to name a few. There were other blockades around the province. And groups behind this are familiar names. We've heard a lot of them before. The Extinction Rebellion, for example. And the spokesperson for this group this time, Save Old Growth, is a fellow by the name of Zane Hack. He is an SFU student. And he says, this is their way or block the highway. We will escalate our tactics in their frequency if the government continue, continues to not respond. So we will block the Trans-Canada Highway at different off-ramps. So the traffic is stationary, people go on an off-ramp on a crosswalk, they move on the crosswalk when the traffic is stationary, and they sit down, and they show complete nonviolence when faced with violence from the public and the police. And those videos will go around the country and that's going to be the first step in changing the national conversation, where people find out slowly that what is stereotypically known as like nice Canadians aren't that nice, and we instead have a very real problem of entrenched power in the country, where a society is refusing to address uh, that we've, we're faced with the greatest criminal government in human history, and we're going about our day without recognizing that. Their way or the blocked highway. Okay, we got to copyright that. That's brilliant. Um, and 
on top of that, same people. It's been identified that these are the same folks at every protest. I have to give it to them, though. They're very innovative. The names are extraordinary. Like, they really got the whole branding thing going on. Um, <laughs> so over a 1,000 people, however, have been arrested. Um, but they don't seem to make any difference in the policy. So that's merely mainly at Ferry Creek. Ferry Creek, they've been arresting people right, left, and center. But some of these same Ferry Creek people now are getting rearrested. <laughs> I don't see any policy changes. Do you? Uh, hunger strikes are a new strategy now being undertaken. They're chaining themselves to thousand pound metal containers. Nanaimo's Will uh, Breen ended up in hospital after refusing to eat for days. Robin, is this making a difference? I don't think so. The doctor told him that today at noon, he would be in some serious, pretty serious trouble within his body. Um, how are you feeling? A little woozy. Um, uh, my balance is beginning to be a bit off, uh, a little lightheaded, uh, moments of dizziness, a little bit... Uh, uh, too much bile expulsion that I care to talk about, but uh, uh, all of that's part of the package right now. Well, you're still with us. That's the main thing. Uh, so, I am. For now? Yeah, day 23. Any desire to give up or quit? Not at all. The real irony here, I think, John, is that the province has already put a two-year moratorium on old growth logging in these disputed areas. So the de negotiations are underway with First Nations, the logging companies. This is the way you move forward on these issues. And it is not black and white. I don't care what the protesters say. This is not black and white. We have to move forward as a people and as a society. And the police arrests um, don't work and the courts don't work. Then what we could really see is something terrible as a final outcome, we could see vigilantism and citizens taking action on their own. We've had a couple of examples of that over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I got a fucking kid. I got kids in the car that are sick. Get the fuck out of the road. Let's get this in. Please don't, these people are just peacefully here. Oh, this is bullshit. We have a lot of fuck. It's so frustrating, <laughs> you know, on so many levels that activists think they can win public support by angering the public. Uh, like, where, where is that policy manual? Where, where, where is that? It didn't work for the truckers' freedom convoy, and it won't work, Robin, for these old growth activists. I don't even know if frustrating reflects enough of the, the bad feelings that these folks are generating. However, <laughs> let's shift again our, politic, our political radar. Some good news regarding yes. Canada's military support for the Ukraine, Rob. Indeed, and it's happened much faster than we thought. We spoke, spoke to Chris Kilford. We'll be speaking to him again in a few moments' time. And uh, he was speculating about maybe there were some guns that we could send to the Ukraine. There were apparently six of them that were in Latvia. There were about 30 in total in Canada. They thought, well, maybe we can get them across. Well, the good news is they are on their way right now, sooner than expected. Canada has sent four M77 artillery guns plus ammunition to the Ukraine. It's an escalation of Canada's commitment. The good part is, according to the former gunnery officer, Chris Kilford, who we depend on and talk to and get such great information, it only takes three to five days to train personnel to use these new weapons. The uh, blasts go 40 kilometers towards targets. They're guided by a GPS system. So. Uh, Canada is doing its part to support Ukraine, and I'm happy to see that. What I really appreciate about, about what we've been talking about is how clearly Ottawa is listening to our show. So, Chris <laughs> Kilford, thank you. 
you know, because you are influencing um, a policy and we are a very much appreciative of that. So, <laughs> you know, he's the, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Kilford. He, he's, he's been providing a ton of military insight for us over the last few months, hasn't he, Robin? He's an instructor at Royal Roads, president of the Victoria branch of the Canadian International Council, and for an update on Ukraine, which we always appreciate, and clearly Ottawa is listening to, let's zoom him in. Now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room, once again, is the president of the Victoria branch of the Canadian International Council, uh, former senior military attache Chris Kilford. And uh, there's urgent news breaking all over the place in the Ukraine right now. And so we thought we'd better have you back as soon as possible, Chris. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here, as uh, always. Yeah, first up, we have Vladimir Putin staring at the camera and unveiling a new Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. And uh, the Russians claim that it's capable of overcoming all modern anti-missile defenses. The Russians are calling it a present to NATO. And they say the destruction of these missiles will end the history of any country that challenges Russia. So this mm -hmm. all sounds very terrible. Should mm -hmm. Ukraine be afraid? Should we all be afraid? Yeah, I think in some respects we should be afraid of uh, Vladimir Putin in, in, in the Kremlin in Moscow because of the actions he's been taking for some time now, but now in Ukraine, yes. I mean, we have to really wonder about what, what he is all about. And I also think this shows us how, how desperate Russia is and how low uh, Russia has fallen, that they have come to this point where they do what we see out of North Korea all the time. Um, we don't have a lot of respect for what happens in North Korea with these missiles that they constantly launch. And now we see Russia claiming that they can uh, break through any sort of uh, anti-missile defenses you have and destroy you and so forth. What kind of rhetoric is this from what we viewed as a modern member of the G20, once of the G8? You know, this is, this is, this is not what we expect from a country like Russia. And this just so shows us, as I said, how, how things have developed and you know, will this country ever respond uh, or, or recover, I should say, recover in the near term when we see this sort of these sorts of displays taking place uh, as we have with, with this intercontinental ballistic missile situation? You yeah. uh, know, Chris, I'm watching on TV regularly the the evilness, the monstrosity, the criminality of, of this man and um, it's just all hard to, to understand and to comprehend. It seems like the war is now reaching some sort of crossroads or shifting. It seems like this is the sharp end of the war. I'd like to get your perspective of what's happening in Dunbass, really. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, certainly. You know, in, in many respects, we get a sanitized view of the fighting that is taking place. If you are watching uh, mainstream news, you'll often get a, a warning telling you that there's graphic content about to be shown. And then you might see some blurred out bodies and so forth. But if you go onto YouTube, for example, and watch uh, organize or watch what Vice uh, News is producing and some others are producing, you actually see things in, uh, that you, you won't see on our television stations. Uh, and, it, and it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible what is happening. So you even get angrier with, uh, with Russia over this. So, yeah. so there, there's a lot of material out there. But I guess, you know, as has been said, the problem uh, that Russia has faced is uh, th this has not gone according to plan. We know that. Uh, they did think it was going to be over very, very quickly. It's now, I think, we're well over the 50-day mark in this uh, particular conflict. They've actually, you know, uh, w when some news channels are talking about this, they'll say Russia's withdrawn from Kiev. Um, that's a very nice term, but the real term to be used is retreat. I mean, they had to retreat. They had to leave because uh, they'd failed to achieve their objectives, and now they've switched over to the Donbass. Now, will they succeed there? That's another question, because um, yes, they've amassed a lot of forces, but the defenders have an advantage. You know, you have to have a much larger attacking force. So that means that the defenders themselves can likely um, hang on and they're getting, getting terrific amounts of support, mm -hmm. as we know, from all of the European countries, especially the United States and Canada shipping in weapons. So that's having a, a big part to play in this. But there will be times 
when the war shifts or has its moments for both sides. So in the Russian sense, yes, they retreated from north of Kiev and they lost their uh, flagship, uh, the Moscow, the Moskova uh, in the Black Sea. Um, imagine, imagine the blow of, of that uh, in Moscow, ha ha that happening. And now we look at Maripol and look, I mean, the defenders there have done it. I can't imagine what they're going through, but I would think that at some point uh, they, that that battle will end. And that will, for us uh, and for the Ukrainian people, um, uh, be a moment that they won't, uh, you know, it, it, it will be a difficult moment. It will be a difficult moment. But the rest of the war will continue. And I would still say, I would still say that the initiative um, is not on the Russian side. Yes, they're still attacking. But I think every day that this goes on, the Ukrainians have, have shown us uh, what they're capable of doing. And I can only imagine in Moscow that uh, there will be a reckoning at some point. I don't know how this is going to play out in Moscow. Will Putin be, will he, will he be gone? Will, what, what will happen? We, he, look, um, the thing is, if, you, know, you can look at, uh, you can see what Russians are watching on their televisions. Uh, there's ample coverage of this if, if one looks uh, on YouTube uh, at coverage that the Russians are being fed every day in Russia by their television networks. And, and it's, um, it's quite disappointing in many respects because they're being told that Ukraine is being, has been using biological weapons against Russia, that they're developing this, that, and the other thing. And, and of course, Russia is right in what they're doing. So breaking that messaging, breaking through on that messaging is, is near impossible. So I'm not looking to see any sort of political uprisings. I'd be shocked if they did occur. Um, but that inner circle, I would imagine around Putin, that inner circle is just wondering where is this all going to end up? It feels like we're just all standing at the gate. You know, these enormous, strong, powerful countries, we're just standing at the gate and we're looking and going, how can we, how can we actually help to, to, to help the Ukraine win? Um, yet we, I feel this in that, you know, come on, mm -hmm. come on, you know, mm -hmm. let's go. And, and even we're seeing some this week, some, some retired uh, senior U.S. Army and NATO commanders, you know, making those viewpoints like we have to decide if we're going to win this or not. But I don't know what that means mm -hmm. politically and literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we just kind of stuck here? <laughs> Well, I think what has been remarkable is the actual response that we have seen, because I think in years past, many uh, governments would have just said, look, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a local Russia thing. It's Ukraine. Um, we're not that concerned. I think what has been key is uh, having uh, President Zelensky there. I mean, he's a masterful, masterful communicator, uh, a masterful user of social media. And he's been able to speak to so many parliaments and, and many other groups and actually galvanize us to take some action. So I think, I think uh, he has a very large role to play. Uh, I think diasporas, Ukrainian diasporas, uh, have had a large role to play as well. Uh, and so, um, and, and I think um, we've become a little bit exasperated with uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia itself <laughs> over, over the course of quite a few years. And so... Uh, all of this has sort of happened at the same time and ended up with the response that the Russians never expected to happen because uh, as they, as we would say, uh, they were unable uh, to read the tea leaves uh, themselves. And so, so uh, this is what's all come about uh, with, with what's happening there. Now, obviously um, there are lots of generals, armchair generals, and I'm not a general, but somebody could easily accuse me of sitting in an armchair as well. And, and pontificating about what should be done, that, that's for sure. Uh, it, it's really easy to, to sit on the sidelines and say, you know, we should do this and we should do that. But at the end of the day, politicians around the world, they're worried about uh, Canadians. They don't want Canadians themselves to, you know, end up in some sort of nuclear exchange over, over um, a, a conflict that's taking place in, in Europe. Uh, so, so they have to be very careful. But look, I mean, simply supplying the weapons that we have and the money that we have. Uh, you know, I, I've said this previously with, with you on, on some of the other talks we've had. We are, you know, essentially 
well, I can't even get my fingers close enough. Uh, we're that close to a declaration of war with mm -hmm. Russia. I would mm -hmm. argue that we essentially have uh, declared war because yes. the weapons we're sending are designed to, to kill Russian soldiers and the more, the better. And that's, that's what it's all about. And of course, Russia senses that, they know this, and that's why they're threatening with whatever they can, but they don't have a lot of tools at their disposal to threaten us any longer, except to show videos of larger ICBMs that they threaten. And, and that's it, that's all they've got left. Um, they're in real danger of uh, running out of steam, running out of energy themselves. I don't know if they really realize it because in those closed governments, no one speaks truth to power. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I could imagine, well, you know, let me put it to you this way, because references to Hitler have been made all throughout this campaign, especially with Russia saying that they're going into Ukraine to denazify uh, Ukraine. And, and through all of this, the image that has come to my mind is uh, with Putin, this applies to Putin, is uh, Hitler in his last days in a bunker in Berlin, cut off from everybody ordering about various formations and uh, you know, military units. I want them to do this. I want them to do that. Dreaming of super weapons that are somehow going to rescue him from the grip of, of the Soviet military and the allies that are coming on to, you know, surrounding Berlin. So I, I picture him in his bunker like Hitler in the last days, um, uh, demanding things that happen. Uh, for things to happen. And yet the reality on the ground is that um, yet again, we see more senior Russian officers being killed on the front lines. You know, the reality is that, 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 that they're in deep trouble. And, and so um, Chris, we, we, we need to watch this. We need, we, you know, every day, every day, the, I, I sense the advantage goes over to Ukraine. Chris, when you say running out of steam, yeah. uh, that comforts me. And I hear that obviously in, Media, I don't actually know what that means. Running out of steam militarily, um, can they actually run out of weapons? Is is that what that means? Or yeah, for sure, um, you can run out of weapons because you start to you know stocks of, of weaponry are not uh, infinite. You can look at the Canadian example. Uh, we've we've given you know hundreds of rocket launchers. Well, there aren't hundreds more left, right? <laughs> there you now you have to go and get them, buy them if you can find them. Or, or you have to ramp up manufacturing lines to build them for you. So, so now in the Western world, we can rely on our allies. If we're short on something, we can probably find the British have something we can use, the Americans we can purchase from, uh, or the French. Uh, but Russia, of course, can't. Once they, they, they would need to uh, look at to their reserve stocks, pull from the reserve stocks, and when they run out, they would have to then you know, get their manufacturing lines up and running. And this all takes time that they really don't have. So great insight from Chris Kilford. As always, we really appreciate his point of view on this. And uh, John, I'd like to also mention there's a very important group that have started an important service in Canada to help refugees find a place to stay in Canada. Uh, they, they have to come in from the cold. A lot of them have escaped with very little. Uh, some of them are in refugee camps. Some of them are in Germany or other countries, but they're trying to find a place to, to wait this out. Uh, some perhaps will eventually immigrate, but a lot of them would like to go home. But what will home look like? We don't know at this point. So this is what the program looks like. Canada hosts Ukrainians has all kinds of entries from families looking to come to Canada. They tell their stories, talk about what they've been forced to leave behind. Wonderful to see that 55,000 people have already signed on to this fake Facebook site and uh, many people are helping. So I encourage you to do the same. Here are a couple of stories. For example, here's one. My name is Dimitro. I'm Ukrainian. I'm 31 years old. My wife and I are looking for a place to stay in Canada. And he got a response from somebody named Mamon. We have accommodation for you in Montreal. This, this refugee situation is unmanageable horror, okay? Like, like you, you can't help putting yourself in their place and, and just thinking about just leaving everything, okay? So really appreciate what you've just talked about and your story, and now I have one. Um, and here's one from Stacy. We're from Maripol. We've lost everything. We own there and have no place to return. Unimaginable. Our friends live in Etobicoke. We would love to find some 
temporary accommodation there while we look for a job and a new home. I'm an illustrator, I'm a web designer, and I'm fluent in English. And finally, we have this note from Marina. Good day to everyone. We are an ordinary family from Ukraine whose life was divided before and after February 24th, 2022. That's, of course, when that war broke out and when the crisis began. So please check out this site, Canada Host Ukrainians on Facebook. And Johnny, Johnny, we're out of time. Just like that, we're out of time. So maybe, again, you could quickly tell people how they can follow Victoria Rumble Room, like the show, become a member of the Rumble Room family. I don't think there's anyone in Canada that covers as many issues as we do in half an hour. And, uh, well... Apparently, a lot of people listen and appreciate the way we do that. And those folks are found on our Facebook site, our Twitter site, clearly our YouTube site, where we really capture everything, uh, on our Instagram site, our TikTok site. You're seeing the addresses show up as I talk. And, of course, our new Facebook um, interactive group that we call the Victoria Rumble Room News and Views, where you can post your events, your opinions, your rebuttals to anything that we have. And so on that note, I remain and always have been and will continue to be a strong supporter of the Ukrainian people and all that they represent and that they're trying to do. A strong believer as well that everyone deserves a family doctor. That's something that is in Canada, that something is all right. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. Um, I also happen to believe uh, in reaching a clean environmental future through education, through negotiation, and not blocking highways. How can that solve anything? Anyway, on that note, I am John Jurisic. And ditto. Ditto, Johnny, to everything you've said. I'm Robin Adair, and rumble on! <laughs> <laughs>